Alex O'Connor, the cosmic skeptic, recently went on Jordan Peterson. I'm not going to play a bunch of... There's a bunch of stuff about religion and funny things that Jordan said and whatnot that happened there. But there is a little bit where Jordan talks to Alex about like a potential shift in the way that he's been approaching topics. And I think it's relevant to us. So just listen to this. You mentioned just before we actually went on air that had you come to see me a couple of years ago, you might have been more inclined to, I, I'm i putting words in your mouth to some degree, so correct me if I'm wrong, to strive for a victory or to make your point, something like that. And you alluded to the fact that your thinking around that has changed to some degree. I suspect that's probably a consequence of experience. So what's changed? In part, it might have something to do with becoming a podcaster and speaking yeah. weekly to people. And you, you can't keep up that energy. Uh, or, or you can, but it becomes totally unwatchable and, and nobody wants to nobody wants to engage in that all the time. I think no. that, there, are, there are times when it's worth doing. And, and to be clear, you know, I still like to, to disagree and do so essentially unapologetically and bluntly. And mm-hmm. that can still come across as quite rude. Mm-hmm. But I think that the way that I would think about a conversation is that, well, what, what are we about to do here? A debate. Mm-hmm. We're about to debate an issue mm-hmm. and I'm going to try to win. And and that's, and not not even, I mean, maybe there's sort of a, an element of pride in there. You want yeah. to win for that sake. But also you really think, well, I want to win because I think I'm right about this. And if I don't, then, you know, I must have just not expressed myself properly. I, I think I... You know, I, what I probably meant when I was saying that is that I would have had more of that cap on than now after having so many conversations with so many people and realizing that not only is it more constructive for myself, I've learned a lot more. You know, yeah. I, and now, now I'm here like, hey, I might, you know, I might learn something today. That would be great. Even if I just learned something about what your worldview is. Um, but also people listening just unanimously say that they prefer it. The last point being quite important, in the positive interpretation there, he's talking about not approaching things like a debate bro, like being willing to hear, you know, there is value to hearing even people you strongly disagree with what their perspective is. And you can challenge people without being obnoxious and whatnot. But there's also the notion that being indulgent, seeking out to avoid saying things too harshly increases your audience, gets you to speak to people. And... Yeah. Take the point of view of being a seeker, a seeker of, of new information, mm. a bit like the sense makers who, who, yes. who don't, who don't criticize each other's points of view, but rather they, they seek to find that, that little bit that they can take and then integrate and then build on. It's, it's very touchy feely, nice sounding stuff, but what it means, doesn't it? In practice is that all of the figures circulating in the conversational sphere are always basically clapping each other on the back and nodding their heads about how wise and interesting and fascinating everyone else is. Yeah, and I will say that actually, I think in this conversation with Jordan, Alex Roller deftly manages Jordan's ego and still raises points of criticism and you know occasionally highlights flaws in his logic it's quite well done so this might be an illustration of the approach that he's talking about bearing fruit but on the other hand i saw alex talk with jonathan pajot and they discussed symbolic sense makery religious uh symbolism interpretations and stuff and and then were impressed that they were able to have you know an insightful conversation despite him being an atheist and, and Peugeot being a, you know, a symbolic religious person. I was like, yeah, but that isn't that impressive. Yeah, like it's a, it's, you're not doing anyone a service, are you? By, like if you went and spoke to Jonathan Peugeot and you eliminated the 95% of stuff, which you were completely whatever, and you found something that you, you could agree on together, then uh, are you doing anyone a, a service with that? I, I don't think so. I think the thing that they people some people see it as a service is you're humanizing the other person, right? Because you're showing that you can communicate across like an atheist and a Christian. But like again, perhaps this is naive of me, but I'm like, of course, of course you can. Like I had various attempts or offers from mainly from like the rebel wisdom people who wanted me to talk to Pajot. And I was fine. I said, you know, I'll talk to Pajot, but I'm gonna say the same things that I would say in in another, like I'll I'll raise the points of criticism I have with him, which are about the conspiracy promotion and the Christian nationalism and and that kind of stuff and various things that he'd said about Alex Jones and whatever. 
And he didn't like that, right? Like, so that never, that never happened. And I could also tell that the people trying to arrange that, you know, David Fuller and stuff, they wanted me to be like, but you don't have to focus on that, right? Like you could have a conversation about, you know, you've studied ritual and religion and he has an interest. So like, aren't you interested in that? And like, well, I know I could have a conversation about ritual. I don't think I'd agree with his take on ritual either, but like, yes, I could do that, but I'm not criticizing him for whatever his symbolic interpretation of ritual is. My criticism is about, you know, rather specific things. So it's, yeah, with Alex and all the people that they recognize that there are costs to engaging combatively and in debate bro type, but they don't seem to weigh up that there are costs to being indulgent and less confrontational as well. And it's not monetary costs, because to be clear, that approach is paying dividends with audience growth and, you know, high profile interviews. But it it is a cost nonetheless, and potentially in the level of how harsh your criticism is towards people like Jordan Peterson, who, you know, like the Destiny interview revealed, unhinged conspiracy theorist, absolute loon. And yes, you can also talk in a more engaging way about symbolism and religion yes he can but you're ignoring a big part of the reason that like he would receive criticism and people would you know be concerned about yeah not addressing those kind of things yeah i think there's a couple of aspects to this firstly it's an appealing uh, meme because like america famously has been very much aware that you know it's it's so terrible because it's impossible that you know people from different factions different political points of view are unable to sort of seemingly have a a productive a stick the, dinner the, yeah that's right <laughs> a productive discussion and uh demonizing each other and making each other out to be just just the absolute worst kind of people and you know there's obviously truth to that so i think people are very receptive to the sort of meme of isn't it amazing that you and i are able to sit down and and have this conversation together but sort of that avoids the fact that the reason you are able to sit down and have this very nice conversation with John is you've avoided all of the difficult and meaningful differences in your opinion. But it, it works for everyone because it because it feels nice and it sounds it sounds good to have these disparate characters interacting with each other. And it works very much for the figures themselves because it's always helpful for you in terms of your audience to sort of, you know, bridge a gap. And, and like when they get together, they're often sharing their audiences, right? They're, it's there's yeah, a bit yeah. of a give Absolutely. and a bit of take. And, and when you take a more, I think, honest kind of line, then you kind of lose that opportunity and you may even lose part of your audience by kind of defining off and saying, no, I don't like this. And so maybe most of your audience, like 80% of, of your audience doesn't like it either, but you lose that 20%. So there's really yeah. nothing, to, nothing to gain from the point of view of an influencer in being straightforward and perhaps a little bit combative, but there's a lot to gain in, you know, finding, find, building those bridges with each other. Yeah. You can, you know, like Destiny or whatever, there is also gains to being the punchy to be it person, right? Like you can build a profile on yeah. that as well, but it's a, it's a l- more lonely path. I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 And it is like the flip side of that is sometimes by having these contrived beefs, right? Both of you benefit, you can build up a, a drama. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can also build up audiences by the touchy feel thing. But it's such a depressing state of affairs when there is there is those two alternatives, which is a hyperbolic, yeah. emotional kind of I can't believe you you know, like this yeah. is idiot. Like, like like the drama between Destiny and um what's his name? Uh, Valsh or Hassan. Uh, Valsh or Hassan, you know, like like they're all benefiting, like Hassan and Destiny benefit from that. Stouch that they as he right? as he described to us, you know, that Batman needs his Joker. Now which yeah. one is Batman and which one is Joker? <laughs> exactly. you, you get debate about, but that's uh, you know that does make for like content for both of them, and they know that. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh well, well it's there a we depressing go, Matt. Of affairs. It's all bad. I know. 